Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for arranging uh, this conference and to giving me the chance to talk about my results. These are motivated by a paper by Bassa, Belen, Garcia and Stichtenot, which just uh, appeared. Uh, uh, the paper with the title Towers of Function Fields over non-prime over non-prime finite fields, and I was trying to give some geometrical interpretation of results of these four people. And these results are related to modular curves of very special type, which I'm going to explain now. Perhaps let's start first with classical modular curves. And these are usually labeled xn, where n is some natural number. And these curves are fibered over x1, where x1 uh, is canonically identified with the projective line over the complex numbers through a J invariant. And this is a Galois cover with group Gn, where Gn is the group SL2 over the finite ri ring Z modulo N, divided out by the scalars plus minus one. And this is a very classical topic, and uh, a lot of results are known uh, about these uh, modular curves. And uh, as I said, this is a Galois cover with this group. Actually, uh, we can replace the group uh, SL2 by GL2 of uh, this finite ring, taking arithmetic into account the constant field extension which is involved. So the right group to consider is the group GL2 of the integers. And this covering has a lot of nice properties. For example, it is ramified at the point with J value zero or 12 cubed, or infinity, and unramified elsewhere. And for example, the ramification group of some point uh, above the point infinity is essentially the group which is symbolically labeled like this, the subgroup of SL2 or GL2 over the integers. These are classical uh, modular curves, and there is um, um, an analog of these classical modular curves where you replace the complex, the classical complex numbers by some positive characteristic analog. So this is the point of Greenfeld modular curves. And in this case, we also have some curve xn, but n happens to be some element of the polynomial ring in one variable over a finite field n. Usually, we assume that n is uh, a non-constant polynomial over fq. And we also have some modular curve without level, which as before, um, is canonically identified with um, pi 1 of some 
things which are labeled by, by C infinity, where in order to describe C infinity, I have to introduce some notation. Let's call the, uh, this ring A, which is a subring of its quotient field K equal to FQ of T, which this field may be, compact, uh, may be completed with respect to its um, um, valuation at infinity. So there will result the power series field in 1 over t. Um, and so you should be aware of the analogy of these data with the classical data. Here we have uh, the integers, which are embedded into the rational numbers, into the real numbers, and into the complex numbers, uh, which will correspond to these data here. And what is lacking in this picture is the analog of the complex numbers. Here we take C infinity as the algebraic closure of our, uh, of our Here we take uh, the algebraic closure of uh, the analog of the real numbers, which is not algebraically, which, is not, uh, which ha uh, happens to be not uh, complete, but once we complete it, it is still algebraically closed. And it's the smallest field extension of our uh, base field K, which is complete with respect to an um, uh, um, absolute value. Uh, over infinity and algebraically closed. And this will be the um, positive characteristic analog of the complex numbers. And there's a far extended um, uh, theory of analytic functions, of holomorphic and meromorphic functions uh, above such fields. And uh, we will use uh, analysis, which is called rigid, uh, rigid analysis, over this uh, field to do our construction. Now this Drinfeld modular curve without a level or with trivial level is uh, canonically identified with a J-invariant of Drinfeld modules with the projective line and still we get a Galois, um, a ramified Galois cover but which has a group G n, which in our case will be uh, essentially G L two of the ring A here divided out by n, and still we have to divide out something which is similar to the group which consists of plus minus one in the classical part. But that's not that important for the moment. So we have uh, quite similar properties of these uh, curves here, namely they are uh, this ex um, um, curve is a Galois covering which is ramified at j equals zero, which corresponds to that case here, and j equals infinity, and the ramification group at infinity is essentially the same as we would expect from the classical analog. So perhaps I should not write here, but it's very close to this and the details are not important for the moment. And in both cases, in both these cases of classical modular curves and Drinfeld modular curves, we can divide out um, some subgroup of this group Gn Namely, we will divide out, we will consider x naught of n, which will be x of n divided out by a certain subgroup, a parabolic subgroup of uh, g of n, which is the subgroup of matrices of that shape here. Then we will get um, modular curves of Hecke type 
in both cases, in the classical case and in the Trinfeld case. And we will have that this curve will be defined over Q in the classical case or over K in the Trinfeld modular case. Um, and this curve will have good reduction at places of Q or K respectively, uh, at such places provided they don't divide the conductor N. And now these curves are good candidates for um, presenting a large number of rational points over a certain finite field. Namely, we can consider x naught of n, we may consider it at fp, where fp in both cases will be uh, either the integers modulo some p or a modulo some gothic p. And we can consider, so this curve is defined over um, uh, the least possible field Q or K respectively. It has good reduction at, though, at such P, so it may be considered as, as a curve over that finite field. And it turns out that in, if we replace the finite field by its unique, quadratic ex uh, ex uh, uh, extension, then we can consider the number of rational points of this object and divide it by the genus. And it will turn out that if we take the lim sub when the absolute value of n tends to infinity and where we have assumed that P does not divide the respective conductors, so we should assume that P does not divide that conductor, we will get that this limb sub is the absolute value of that, or, or, or the size of this uh, prime number P minus one, which is the best possible bound that can be achieved by the trinfeld ladut bound, and it is actually achieved, but not over the base field, CP or AP respectively, but only over its quadratic extension. And what we do here is we are using the super singular trick which means that we can um, describe certain points on these modular curves, reduced modulo p, the so-called super singular points which correspond either to super singular elliptic curves or to super singular Dringfeld modules of uh, rank 2. When we can count these points, there's an easy formula for these points, and also we know that these points are rational uh, at least over the quadratic extension of the, um, of the prime field here. And because we can count these, uh, 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 these numbers of super singular points and we can calculate the genus of these um, uh, curves, then we can calculate uh, the limb sub. And in both cases, in the classical modular case and in the Greenfeld modular case, we have uh, uh, this bound, which is the best we can hope for. Um, and as, you, uh, as all of you know, there is, um, well, such um, towers of curves with uh, many rational points have an important uh, application in, in coning theory. And on the other hand, we know that um, uh, this number here is, is an upper bound, which can be achieved in the case where the um, finite field under consideration has quadratic order, but for non-quadratic um, um, for finite fields of non-quadratic order, um, uh, the precise upper bound is not known. But now in the paper mentioned in the beginning, the paper by Bassa, Belen, Garcia and Stichtnot, they found 
series, they didn't work with algebraic curves, but with, um, with um, function fields, which is the same up to language. And they got a very good lower bound for uh, some similar construction, which does not fully achieve that possible upper bound, but which is the best uh, lower bound known so far. But their construction was of a purely algebraic nature, and uh, it was my aim to understand these curves from a geometrical side. And I will try to generalize these things. You see, classical modular curves, they are um, imprisoned in the framework of the algebraic group GL2 or um, uh, SL2 or GL2, so you cannot generalize this to other groups uh, to get similar constructions. But this uh, is not the case for Drinfeld in the Drinfeld modular curves uh, case because there are higher rank Drinfeld modules and moduli schemes where you could try to replace the acting groups GL2 by uh, GLR with uh, larger R than 2. And this is what I'm going to explain in what follows. Before doing so, let me fix some notation. We let F be some fixed finite field with Q elements and with algebraic closure F bar. And we let F n be the unique extension of degree n of f in its algebraic closure. And we take uh, the same data as before. A will be f of t and k, k infinity, c infinity, and so on, will be as, as before. And uh, we are going to consider m R, which uh, in more extended language will be MR of 1 over C infinity. This is the modular scheme for Drinfeld modules. Drinfeld A modules of rank R, um, where for simplicity we assume that R is uh, at least 3, because the case R equals 2 is completely described by the above. And uh, well, we need not really know what a Drinfeld module is, but uh, I will just give a few explanations which are necessary for uh, what follows. This is an open and dense subscheme of a weighted projective space weighted projective space p r minus 1 over c infinity uh, of dimension r minus 1 and uh, we can give coordinates well let we consider a Drinfeld module a Drinfeld module is nothing else than a certain operator polynomial which has this shape where the GI are elements of G in, uh, C infinity and the last one must be non-zero. And these data, um, com uh, completely, uh, they, they can be chosen arbitrarily with this restriction. And they will define a Drinfeld module of rank R over that field C infinity. Um, and so these are the, uh, the um, coefficients of the Drinfeld modules. And these um, GIs, uh, also serve as uh, coordinates on that weighted projective space where the weight of some GI will be uh, Q to the I minus 1. 
And um, so the MR is simply that subspace which is defined that the, uh, by the condition that the last coordinate be non-zero. Um, and then we get uh, we get um, uh, a ramified covering MR of N, if now N is an arbitrary element, if N is an arbitrary element of our polynomial ring A, then we will get uh, the Drinfeld moduli scheme with a structure of level N, which will be a ramified Galois covering of our M, M, R of 1 with group um, G, L, R of A modulo N. And we, here we should divide out a certain uh, well, divided out by Z, where Z is the group of scalar matrices where A belongs to our, to the multiplicative group of our field here. Then we will get a ramified covering, but unfortunately, this is a ramified covering not of curves, but of higher dimensional schemes. So we cannot, um, we, we don't get uh, what we want uh, with this construction. But in specifying cer certain subcurves of this projective space and taking the inverse images, we will get uh, what we want. Um, well, we will consider simply the, um, consider consider Drinfeld modules uh, phi defined by phi of t, where only the zeros and the last of these coefficients are possibly non-zero, and one further, and f one further um, uh, coefficient g k uh, defined by, and we will call these r k sparse because only the zeros, the r's, and one other possible coefficient g k uh, happen to be non zero. So this is a very, corresponds to a very easy. Um, subscheme of our MR here. And um, in order to understand this notion, I should say a few words about how we associate a Drinfeld module with, uh, with these uh, data. And in, uh, for this, we define the Drinfeld uh, uh, analytic space omega r. This is the subspace of all omega, where omega is omega 1 to omega r of um, uh, pr of c infinity which do not belong, which do not satisfy any linear equation, omega does not lie in any h uh, over k infinity for uh, hyperplanes. So if we, if we take here r equals 2, then this simply means that the point does not correspond to uh, some point uh, with coordinates in k infinity. And in the analogy with the classical case, this means just that we have here the complex numbers, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, 
the projective, well, actually, I should take here r minus 1. Uh, in, in the classical uh, um, analogy, where r equals 2, um, this upper, uh, this um, analytic space is simply the complex numbers minus the real numbers, so uh, essentially the complex upper half plane, and therefore this is also often called uh, the Dringfeld upper half plane, but of dimension r minus 1, if r happens to be different from 2. And we can associate with each uh, element of omega r, we can associate an element, uh, well, we, we have a mapping from here to mr of 1, say, over the complex numbers, in that we associate with each omega here a lattice lambda omega, which is a times omega 1 plus plus a times omega r. This is a discrete lattice. Um, discrete lattice in, uh, in C infinity. Um, the discreteness comes from the fact that we have excluded th those bad omegas here. And so with this lattice lambda omega, we can associate uh, by some construction which is similar to the Weierstrass uniformization of elliptic curves, we can uh, associate a Drinfeld module, let's label it by phi omega, um, and the uh, construction is such that we associate with this lattice, some lattice function uh, um, analogous with uh, uh, Weierstrass uh, uh, p function or sigma function and, and all these uh, um, sorts of functions. And from the uh, functional equations of these functions, we get a Drinfeld module. Uh, this Drinfeld module, well, actually, this omega is not a point of... Um, uh, of um, uh, affine space, but of projective space, so this omega is defined only up to scaling, but scaling, uh, uh, the, uh, the projective coordinates of omega scales just that Drinfeld module and replaces it by, um, by um, an isomorphic Drinfeld module. And so we get a mapping uh, from uh, um, uh, like this, and uh, we can uh, we actually f we find that, well, Omega R, uh, omega R is acted upon uh, by the group, uh, say, um, let's call gamma, the group GLR of A, which is the modular group in this context. And if we, uh, for that group gamma, we have the congruence subgroups gamma N, which consists of those matrices which are congruent to the unit matrix modulo the uh, divisor n, and we can divide out uh, gamma n and find from this construction a bijection uh, of, of, this, of, of, the, um, of omega r divided out by the, the action of gamma with m r1, here the c infinity valued points, and actually we may, if we replace gamma by, by some congruence subgroup, we will get similarly uh, um, an isomorphism like this. So this means that we can study these moduli curves by analytically studying uh, uh, this uh, rigid analytic space, the action of its group gamma n, and we can get uh, information about these moduli schemes from, uh, from um, making analysis on the analytical uh, space omega. Uh, and now I introduced uh, um, uh, our case pass Drinfeld modules and it will turn out that just these RKs past Rinfeld modules will provide us with a Galois cover of curves which has similar properties like the curves above but where the group GL2 is replaced by 
uh, higher, uh, by some higher GR. Well, from now on, let us assume that uh, the K that occurs here in the sparsity condition on dream fed modules, so that K and R are relatively prime. This is not a restriction, but this is a, to some uh, extent um, a normalization of the problem. So we make uh, this assumption here. And we will consider, we will consider um, the subspace omega RK. This consists of those omega in omega R such that the associated Trinfeld module, say, is RK sparse. And this is a closed analytical subspace. And which is stable, stable under the action of the group gamma. And we can now state the main result in this direction which will be the following theorem A. Um, there exists a unique affine curve, unique up to unique isomorphism, Y R K of N. Um, this is a curve defined over C infinity such that if we take um, the associated analytic space of this curve to each algebraic curve, we can associate an analytic curve over this field C infinity, and such that the points of this analytic curve are simply given by our omega RK divided out by and so, to some extent, we can call this, an, uh, this, is, this is an algebraic curve, uh, which has certain properties which will come in a moment. And actually, this is the moduli space in the algebraic sense of RK, um, moduli space of RK sparse. Um, Trinfeld modules. And uh, the, uh, if we take level one, so if n equals one, so we have something which, are, which I simply label without any level. Uh, this is isomorphic with the affine line over C infinity by some J invariant, and the J invariant should be labeled. It depends, of course, on these data R and K. So we can take its canonical compactification and get a P1 like in the first examples. The omega RK of N is smooth and connected. In particular, the connectedness is, um, is a serious problem, but it can prove, be proved to be connected. And um, so let, let XRK of N be its smooth uh, compactification. So it is a, which is a projective curve. Um, then we will get that XRK of N is defined over 
a finite field extension of k, which are labeled by k plus of n, and k plus of n is something which corresponds in the classical case to the maximal real subfield of the field uh, of nth roots of unity. So essentially you would expect, we know in the classical case, these curves xn, classical modular curve xn is defined over the field of nth roots of unity. This is something similar, but we have to replace the field of nth roots of unity by its maximal real subfield. This corresponds essentially to the fact that classically um, the, um, the complex numbers minus the real numbers has two connected components, the upper and the lower half plane. And because uh, uh, these fall together um, in, uh, in the function field framework, this is essentially the reason that we have to replace k, uh, kn by k plus n. So, but in any case, this is a good uh, curve uh, defined over, um, uh, this is an abelian extension of uh, well, a uh, uh, Galois group of, um, say, k plus of n over k is uh, canonically identified with a modulo n with the multiplicative group of this finite ring. But here I have to divide out the subgroup f star which sits inside and this just this would be the uh, the uh, um, Galois group of the field k of n which corresponds to the full field of nth roots of unity but because i have to take the maximal real part i have to divide out that group here so this field is defined over a finite abelian extension of k and um, and has good reduction, good reduction at places, say, P of that field of K plus N with P don't divide N. And, well, this is only... <laughs> Well, only one half of that statement. There will still be some others. And, um, well, uh, xr of k, n, so this curve we are considering the moduli space of rk sparse Dringfeld modules with a structure of level n, this is fibered, fibered over um, x r k of one, on which I make a statement in item two, um, with Galois group, and here we have the same statement essential as, as in the first blackboard but the group GL2 replaced by GLR and the precise statement is uh, with Galois group gamma divided out by its concurrent subgroup gamma n and I also have to divide out the subgroup z which is simply the subgroup uh, the multiplicative group of our finite field F star, but considered as a subgroup of our group gamma. And this can be written in another way. This group is the same thing as uh, the group of all gamma in GLR of A modulo, the integers, where the determinant of gamma belongs to F star. And here, still, I have to divide out the group 
Z now considered as a subgroup of this group here. So essentially, that's, that's a group of GLR type, which occurs as uh, the uh, Galois group of this ramified uh, Galois covering, and this is what we want to have. And finally, we can say something about the ramification of XRKN over XRK of 1. This is, well, we have a J invariant, and we have this, um, uh, this is above J equals 0. We have some ramification where the stabilizer group of such a ramified point here is isomorphic with a certain subgroup I'm going to explain in a moment, CR divided out by Z, which is a subgroup of GLR over our finite field, divided out by Z, which is a subgroup of our GN. And this is now, the, this group here is now labeled as GN in our case. And it is uh, ramified above J equals uh, infinity, um, where the stabilizer group is conjugated with some subgroup inside Uh, this is um, conjugate with some group of the following shape. I have two parameters, R and K. And we take matrices inside our G of N, which have a certain block structure, where here we have some zero, here we have no restriction, but here we have uh, some group of shape C R minus K, and here we have some group C of K, and now I'm obliged to describe what I mean with these groups C R, and this can be done as follows um, for a subgroup, subgroup C of GL say N over some finite field E, the following are equivalent. Um, C is cyclic of order Q to the N minus one. And second, C is the image, image of F star of the n field extension on F, here the multiplicative group, which we consider as a subgroup of GLN F. Um, well, the, uh, take a matrix, uh, uh, take a basis uh, of the F vector space Fn and represent each element of the multiplicative group as the matrix that corresponds to multiplication by that element. This is matrix representation of multiplication. And the third of these properties is C is stabilizer. stabilizer of some point omega in omega n. This is the Drinfeld half space, the uh, Drinfeld analytic space, but I can evaluate it on, the, on f to the n, on the points of the nth field extension of the finite field f. So these three properties for a subgroup of GLNF are equivalent, and we call these uh, groups 
for simplicity, these are carton subgroups um, in the general sense of a very specific type. I simply call it a carton subgroup, and I label it by C of n. All these groups, all these subgroups of GLn of f, which satisfy one of these properties, are conjugate, and I choose once for all for each n one such group and label it by Cn. And now this means, for example, that the stabilizer, the stabilizer group of some point, uh, of some ramified point, is some Carton subgroup inside GLR of F, but I have still have to divide out that diagonal subgroup here. And over J infinity, I have, have also stabilizer groups which may be described through these Carton subgroups, namely inside that group, which uh, essentially is the matrix, which essentially is this here, I take just uh, the subgroup of matrices with that kind of block structure, but where uh, uh, that block and that block are restricted to, um, uh, to be of the type uh, here, uh, the entries occurring here belong uh, to a carton uh, 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 subgroup of shape R minus K and here a carton subgroup of shape uh, uh, K. So this is uh, the, uh, this is the de full description of the ramification uh, of that uh, Galois covering. Um, and we have no, uh, no other ramification. So this in particular allows us, because we have nice algebraic groups which are ramified in a certain way, uh, above the projective line, this allows us to calculate the genus of these curves provided we know that this describes the full ramification. And this is the last and final point of this theorem, the order ramification is modest, which is the next best to ramification being tame, and which means second higher ramification groups are trivial. And now having these data together, this allows to calculate, so perhaps I have to take it like this, this allows to calculate the genus of this curve x r k of n, which of course depends on many parameters r, k, and n, and so on. This is what can be said about um, the general features of this construction. But we want to apply this to the question of um, uh, algebraic curves over finite fields with, um, with many rational points. And remember here on the first blackboard we have seen that we have uh, replacing the curve xn by some x0 of n, we get some curve which is defined over q or k respectively, which has good reduction properties which may be reduced at a finite place and then um, we can get such curves with many rational points. And this is um, uh, the corresponding construction here is given by theorem B, which states let Pn uh, in Gn be the subgroup, which consists of matrices with a similar block structure like here but without any restriction on, on the entries, without the restriction that the left lower corner should be zero, and, and, define, and define x, r, k, naught 
of n to be x r k of n divided out by that curve p n. And then we have then x r k naught of n is defined actually over k with good reduction with good reduction at primes p that do not divide n. So we have a good candidate for playing the game of the first blackboard and this is achieved by the last statement theorem C which says uh, let ni uh, be any sequence in A with degree ni tending to infinity and where the ni are co-prime with the element t. Therefore, we can reduce at t and then we get then x naught rk of ni. Well, we may regard this as a curve defined over ft. Note that ft is nothing else than a divided out by t and this is nothing else than our field f we started with. So we can consider this curve at ft, but we can consider its rth extension so, and we can count the number of points of this curve defined over the finite field but curves ra uh, points rational over this field extension and we may, may divide by the genus and then we still get that the lim sub of uh, this quantity um, is positive so this means it is a good uh, series of curves over, considered as curves of that finite field but uh, what we actually get is it is larger than c this is a certain constant depending on the two numbers r minus k and k where cij is the constant q to the i minus 1 times q to the j minus 1 divided by q to the i plus q to the j minus 2 the whole provided with a factor of 2 so the limb sub of this quantity is larger or equal to this one and uh, some of you will know that constant this is the constant occurring in the work by Bassa, Delen, Garcia and Stichtenot. So in other words, this construction of curves, unfortunately it doesn't get a better bound than in the BBGS paper, but it reproduces precisely the same bound, but gives a geometric framework in which these curves can be considered. And it is at this point where I would like to stop. Thank you. So, thank you for this talk. Uh, are there comments, questions? Misha? Uh, I have two questions. First of all, is this... Uh, Thanks. Uh, is uh, this uh, RK sparse uh, thing uh, defined by some intrinsic modular property? Yes, the modular problem is simply Drinfeld modules which are RK sparse. Uh, but that depends uh, on uh, the equation of the Drinfeld module. Can you uh, define it not by the equation but by some property like super singularity or something like that? Um, Well, I, I would say it, it is, um, uh, it is an, a reasonably defined algebraic object, namely a, 
a Dreenfeld module, but um, subject to certain restrictions, so many coefficients have to vanish. These are, well, the coefficients that vanish, these are modular forms to some extent. So if you want, you can re um, describe it in terms of modular forms. Or you can, uh, quite generally, uh, given any um, set of modular forms, of rank R modular forms, you can um, uh, put some restrictions on them, for example, some identities between modular forms, and if these identities are satisfied, you call this, uh, the, the object under considerations, you give it a, a certain name, and then you can consider the moduli of, of these objects. And so it is in this framework. But it, of course, it is related, I didn't mention this in the talk, it is related to super singularity because if you take this, I said um, these curves are defined over K and um, well, so you can reduce it. This, uh, this comes from general moduli theory because, uh, because you have reasonable moduli problems and then you can describe it this, this way. And well, considering these things in, in a certain characteristic P, um, the vanishing of many coefficients is all, is, gives you almost super singularity. But if, you, if all the coefficients, except for the zero and the, the highest, uh, vanish, then you, you have some super singular uh, situation. And therefore, these curves are by construction very close to being super singular. So you need only one further condition uh, after a reduction to, to get them super singular. And then the counting that occurs at this place is really a counting of super singular points because, uh, well, from, from the geometric data here, we can easily describe the super singular points and we can count them in group theoretical data. And uh, we know from general theorems about super singularity that also these super singular points on that modular scheme are defined over the Rth field extension of, of the base field here. And so this construction is, is very, very close to what is being done in the classical case. But in the classical case, you, there is no generalization to higher ranks. But in the Drinfeld model uh, case, there is one. And the second question is, uh, if uh, we're interested not in curves, but seeing surfaces, uh, are we able to do the same thing to calculate the better numbers and the number of points? For, for uh, which kind of curves? For uh, uh, um, uh, suppose we are interested not in curves but on, in surfaces. Uh, uh, so yes, you at least two, two yes, extra coefficients mm. or something like that. Yes, in principle one can. The point, the very interesting point, which is uh, hidden behind all of this, is but when you try to prove this, for example, we can. The, the largest and most difficult part in the proof is constructing good fundamental domains for the action of gamma on, uh, well, what I called here omega rk. These are, uh, this is the subspace, well, where does it occur? It occurs in the, in the blackboard. No, it is here. We must construct uh, good fundamental domains for the action of the group gamma on this analytic space. And this means we must understand the lattices associated with such omegas here. And the lattices that correspond to our case past Drinfeld modules are very special. Um, in, uh, well, I could give uh, you a technical description, but for the moment, let's just say they, they are very special. And because they are, well, for example, we can find, um, 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 a basis, a lattice basis, uh, lowest, how is it called classically, um, a, a successive minimum basis. And the successive minimum basis is such that only two different lengths of vectors occur. This is a very special property. And this allows to give us, uh, um, to, to describe um, a fundamental domain. And now coming back to your, uh, um, to your uh, question, if you uh, take, if, if you assume that the Drinfeld module is not our case parse, but we have two 
possible coefficients in the Trinfeld module, then you will get a similar property for the lattices. Then you will have only three different lengths in a successive minimum basis. And so uh, large parts of the proof given here certainly generalize to higher dimensional cases. But of course, this would involve a lot of, of work because um, uh, all of this must be carried out and, and, and so far nothing is in the literature about these thing, questions. One more quick question. Not even. No? Well, then okay. Thank you. Thank you.